Episode 48 Pumpkin and sweet potato mush. Crusts of bread everywhere. The turkey is still too cold. But I've got a cup of coffee. Greetings, and welcome into the Patuxent General. We're going to leave the turkey to you and bring you dessert, alcoholic and non. We've got a creepy local folklore tale and a walk in the park. But first, we want to thank our Patreon subscribers like Jen, who wrote in to say that last week's French meat pie recipe was nearly identical to her grandmother's French meat pie. All right, yay authentication! And thanks, Jen and Amy and the rest of our Patreon subscribers, who are the fruit, crust, sugar, and spices that make up the blueberry pie that is the Patuxent General, without whom we would merely be a glass dish. So thank you. First up, I have a poem from a book of college poetry called Hydra, from Rhode Island College, circa 1960s. This particular edition was censored and then defended by Rhode Island College's chaplain, Father Maynard, who cited the censorship as suppressing academic freedom, mostly due to its questioning of the Vietnam War. My father and his friends were all featured in this controversial edition. Great writers all, but this is my dad's. I'll feature my adopted uncles in future episodes. This is my father's untitled account of his exposure to Joni Baez. Thank you, R. Watts, for the submission. It had begun to get cold when she finally came on stage. A soft onshore wind was fanning the salt smell through the stadium. A dew had formed on the day's dust. Mud lay in a thin crust on the ground that stuck to your bare feet in layers like damp flour. We squirmed a bit and hunched over a little more, whispering to each other that they had saved the best for last. She sang a Dylan song first, one of his romantic ballads, I think, and then swung into a rock and roll parody. After that, I lost track of what she was singing because I became absorbed by her voice and her expression. Her guitar was all around me, and I felt religiously intimate with the instrument and with her fingers. What impressed me most was her gentleness. I suppose it was then that she became a sort of Madonna thing to me that I've always cherished, even when three years later I saw her frogging on stage in front of 15,000 people. But now a fog was being wafted in, first in shreds and then like giant cotton balls. The fog gave her voice a mystical quality that I sometimes still hear when I'm close to the sea, and I could feel her fingers picking on my spine and raising goose flesh on my arms, and the music was coming as much out of me as out of her guitar. Seemingly hours had passed before she took off her guitar strap and made thank you gestures at the crowd and walked towards the wings, but the crowd roared its disapproval so she came back to center stage. She was talking for about a minute and everyone started to get up. She played the first few bars of We Shall Overcome, and twelve and a half thousand people became one with her. When we finished singing all the verses, several of them made up right there on the spot. People began filing out, many humming softly to themselves, many just dazed, looking at the ground, for everyone knew instinctively that it was all over and that it was perfect. And if we tried to belong it any more, it would be strained. As we went out the gate, the double rows of cops searched us with their inquisition faces, as if we carried contraband out of there or something. But you couldn't even hate the cops that night. Oatmeal toddy cake. Today's cocktail is a cake. Let me sum up. Think of it like spice cake meets fruit cake meets con leche cake with whiskey. Call me intrigued. This recipe is broken into steps, the ingredients as well, but I will remind you as we go through so that you don't get lost. This recipe was submitted to the Cape Cod Times by Mary E. Cummings. It seems to be the perfect Thanksgiving day after cake, just what you need to fortify you for all that cleanup. For the oatmeal toddy cake, you will need one cup of old-fashioned oatmeal, one quarter cup all bran, one quarter pound butter, one and a half cup boiling water, one and a half cup flour, half a teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of baking soda, 
a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, one quarter teaspoon ground cloves, one cup sugar, one cup brown sugar, two eggs, one quarter pound butter, three quarters of a cup sugar, one quarter of a cup evaporated milk, one cup flaked coconut, one cup chopped walnuts, one quarter cup whiskey, and one tablespoon lemon juice. Combine all ingredients in step one and let stand 10 minutes. Uh, that is the one cup of oatmeal, one quarter cup all bran, one quarter pound butter, and one and a half cup boiling water. Sift together all ingredients in step two and set aside. That is the one and a half cup flour, one half teaspoon salt, one teaspoon baking soda, one half teaspoon cinnamon, and one quarter teaspoon ground cloves. Combine step three sugars, add eggs one at a time, beating well, stir into step mixture one. The sugars are one cup regular sugar, one cup brown sugar, and two eggs. Pour step two dry mix into the batter. Pour into a well-greased nine by nine by two pan. You bake at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. When done, do not remove from the pan, but with a fork, prick holes on top of the hot cake. Now, for the topping. Combine all the ingredients in step four in a saucepan. Those are one quarter pound butter, three quarters of a cup sugar, and one quarter cup evaporated milk. Bring them to a boil, stirring, and remove. Add all the ingredients of step five and pour evenly over the hot cake. Let the cake cool in pan. The step five ingredients are one cup flaked coconut, one cup chopped walnuts, one quarter cup whiskey, and one tablespoon lemon juice. After you pour them evenly over the cake, let the cake cool in the pan. When ready to serve, run under broiler four to five minutes, five inches from the heat source. Note, leftover servings are not rebroiled. I just have to admit that broiling after you add the whiskey sounds a little dangerous. I would serve fresh from the oven. Enjoy! Today we're walking through Patuxet Park. Patuxet Park is located at 2 East View Street, Warwick, Rhode Island, 02888. A very interesting historical background of the area can be found at PatuxetRangers.com. This is the actual place where the Hannah was brought ashore after the burning of the Gatsby, but we're here for a stroll. Starting at the General itself and walking north on Narragansett Parkway, you quickly come across East View Street on your right. As you turn down the street, there is a good-sized parking lot on your right in front of the Asprey Boathouse. If you follow the street to the bottom of the hill, you are confronted with a magnificent water view. On the left, there are benches for watching the tide roll in or out. And if you follow the sidewalk up and around, you come to the gazebo. In the summertime, the gazebo often houses live music, but its glory is in the winter when the holiday lights surround it and the tree and the menorah are lit up. It looks like fairies came and touched their wands all over the park. All year long, festivals are had here of all different kinds. Crafters, food trucks, reenactments, holiday shops, and the last for the best, the Gatsby Days celebrations. I certainly believe this to be the actual beating heart of Patuxet Village. It brings us all together in equal measure, perfect for the holidays. So check it out. Perhaps I'll see you there at Patuxet Park. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball and pinball and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. I love blueberry pie. A pie so good, it inspired a song by Bette Midler. 
It sounds just like the dessert tastes. Sweet, fresh, with just enough juice to barely be contained by the crust. Blueberries are local, and during warm falls like this was, are often still around. Any way around it, they must be fresh for this recipe. Its simplicity calls for the best ingredients. These small details make all the difference. It does not, however, come with a pie crust. For that, I will give you a reminder walkthrough from episode 44. If your pie dish is nine inches or larger, you may want to double this recipe. But the rule of thumb is one recipe per crust. You can always cut off the extra and use the trims for jelly cookies. For one crust, you will need parchment paper, one cup flour, one third cup butter, unsalted and cold and cubed, four tablespoons ice water. Have a little more on hand in case you need it. A rolling pin or wine bottle, a mixer or just your hands. Mix the butter cubes and flour until the butter is tiny pieces and granules of flour. Then add the ice water. Be careful to just barely combine it until it sticks together in a ball. A few drops more if you need it. Then sandwich the ball between two parchment papers and roll out in a circle that will cover your pie pan with about one inch to spare to make the crust edge. Fold it under the edge so that you can get a good decorative edge that will support the edge of your pie. Pinch your thumb and forefinger into an angle, then press all along the edge, each indentation next to the other. It is now ready to fill. For this blueberry pie recipe, you will need two and one half cups blueberries, some flour, a cup of sugar, one half teaspoon of salt, and pastry for two crusts. Line a deep pie plate with pastry. Fill with berries lightly dredged with flour, sprinkled with sugar and salt. Cover the pastry, prick the top with a fork, and bake in a hot oven, 400 degrees, about 10 minutes. Then reduce heat to moderate, about 350 degrees, and continue baking about 30 minutes. It makes one large, beautiful blueberry pie. Enjoy. Old Stormalong and the Octopus One day, Old Stormalong, the ultimate sailor, was sailing the Corsair through the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean when a particularly large wave knocked the anchor loose. The anchor plunged right down to the bottom before the sailors could reel her in, and it got caught on something. The big ship lurched to a halt, and the sailors rushed hither and thither, back and forth, trying to figure out how to shake the anchor loose. Finally, Old Stormalong pushed the sailors aside and gave the anchor a tug himself. But that anchor was stuck firm, and the sailors begged Stormy not to pull at it again, because they were afraid that he would wrench a hole in the bottom of the world and all the water would spill out into space. So, Old Stormalong, he decided to go down to the depths and see if he could unhook the anchor from whatever it was tangled to. Taking the knife between his teeth, Old Stormalong dove into the water. For a few minutes, nothing happened. Then the waters below the massive ship began to bubble and churn. The waves grew higher and higher until the ship was tossed like a rubber duck in a bathtub. Even the old sailors grew seasick and clutched the rail, groaning aloud. After a few minutes, the waves started to calm, and then Old Stormalong popped his head out of the water. She's good to go, boys. Hoist anchor, he shouted. Old Stormalong climbed aboard while his men hoisted the giant anchor. As soon as they caught their breath, the sailors asked their captain why the anchor had gotten stuck on the bottom. It was a giant octopus playing games down one of the canyons, Old Stormy explained. It took a hold of the anchor with four legs and then was using the other four to hold on to the bottom of the sea. How did you get the anchor loose? asked the first mate. Well, I just arm wrestled that old whale bait until it shouted for mercy and then tied its arms into double carrick pens. <laughs> It'll take a better part of a month for all the knots to come undone. And that is the story of Old Stormalong and the Octopus. Thank you once again for joining us here at the PG. If you have a special pie, ghost story, or comment like our friend of the podcast, Jen, our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. Please reach out. We would love to hear from you. You're invited to come chat at our pop-up general store open this week 
Outside Tag Sale Treasures for Small Business Saturday, this week, November 26th, from noon until 4. We'll have baked goods, nuts, cheeses, meats, and breads. Perfect to restock those pantry shelves after Thanksgiving. But until then, I'll meet you right back here at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production, pre-recorded in Patuxent. <laughs>